Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organisers of this conference for giving me the chance to share a few ideas with all, all of you. Mm, I've been here for the duration of the conference and I found it extremely interesting. Now I'm going to talk about a controversial subject, but we shouldn't shy away from controversy. And we need to consider technology, regardless of our approach to that same technology. <clears throat> so, let's look at waste management. We receive the waste, when that we directly or I indirectly treat it. And then we create material from this to create a new product or we obtain a hydrocarbon or fuel. And through this process, we remove more and more fractions to end up with the end product, and the end products might end up in landfill. So we therefore need to take out this fraction, first through sorting, and then we need sorting methods when we collect mass waste and then we end up with waste at the end of it. This is the end waste and there's various different things we can do with this waste before we throw it in landfill and one of the alternatives for us is energy production. So we can then look at the waste that we have and we can then further separate this waste to obtain energy. How are we going to obtain this energy? We can take it to uh, factories that are consumers of energy, for example, cement ovens or weaver industries or these kinds of industry plants. But then we have areas where we don't have these factory facilities. So our other alternative would be the creation of specific teams who can then recover this waste. So let's take a look at this fraction. I'm not talking about all of the rubbish bag itself. I'm talking about the remaining fraction after the recycling or other types of energy recovery. This is what is left over at the end of the day. What are we going to do with it? So let's look at this waste. We're going to use thermic treatment. Uh, first to reduce hazardous materials and also to reduce the quantity of the waste. And then once again, we can look at this material as raw material. And how are we going to recover the value of this raw material? We can obtain energy, but we can also obtain materials. There is a part that will not be converted into CO2 and water. This is the solid element, and we can also recover the value of this. And once we've done the thermal process, once we've finished this process, we then need to apply similar approach as we would with recycling. We end up with waste, we end up with landfill, and we end up with emissions. This is the end result of any process that we might want to apply, but we also need to apply energy to actually apply the treatment process and we also need to look at the raw materials that we produce at the end of the day. We also need to take into account the investment necessary and what are the operational costs of this process. And furthermore, when we look at uh, thermic processing, we need to look at social rejection. Obviously people are not always mm, happy with these processes. They don't want to see it done. Mm. So we need to look at this and we also need to look at other procedures such as pyrolysis and gasification. So what are we going to do through gasification? We're not going to have sufficient air or oxygen for complete combustion. We're going to have partial combustion by supplying less oxygen and then we will have high calorie value gas which we can then burn off. So we have two stages. 
We are developing this. We have a, a, a pilot plant for gasification, but this is not the most widely used technology at present. And next we have pyrolysis. What we need is to contribute energy in the first place because it's an endothermic process. And then we obtain energy afterwards. Using energy in the flow in the first place, we're going to obtain liquid, which we can then put to further use in the future. So these are all different types of treatment. They are thermic waste treatment procedures that we use to obtain energy. Well, we don't know which is best or worst. Which is best from an environmental point of view? Well, the one that produces less waste and fewer emissions. So therefore, we have applied the general label of incineration to all of these different processes. Incineration, when we treat urban solid waste with air to obtain energy or to reduce the hazardous materials in that waste. Now we can see from this diagram, this is the incineration process. It's in theory quite a simple process. We have an oven. We burn off the material, the combustion, in the oven, which is converted to CO2 and water. And then what's left over is the waste that cannot be burnt. It has been carbonated. This is like the scum that's left over at the end. And then the gases are filtered through a system which allows us to recover the energy. Sometimes we recover the energy for thermal use and then we, on other occasions, we produce electric energy. We, this produces ashes, not scum, as we had in the first process. And then we use gas to eliminate the remaining polluting substances that are left over in this ash. And finally, we obtain new ash from the old ash, slightly different to what we had at the very beginning. Mm. And we also have damp purifying systems, and we often have liquid effluent as a byproduct at the end of this process. So this is a diagram of the process. So we need to evaluate it from an environmental point of view. What are we releasing into the atmosphere? What do we emit? Well, we emit particles, various different acid gases, uh, hydrochlorides, uh, fluorine gases, the acid gases, sulfuric acids. We also release heavy metals, which are also pollutants, many different types of heavy metals. This is contained in the fraction that ends up in the incineration plant. And we also have organic compounds. These are volatile organic compounds. They contain carbon, the VOCs, carbon oxides and dioxins, and so on and so forth. We have solid waste. As you can see in the diagram, we have different types. We have the scum and we have the oven waste, slag and oven ashes. Uh, so these are the various different processes of ash production, primary and secondary. We also have liquid effluents that are produced by the process in the furnace. And then we have liquids that have been a part of the process because these might be refrigerant liquids or liquids that are produced uh, any part of the industrial process. And then we have re reactive uh, the reagents, uh, which we use to remove the polluting aspects. And then we have the solid uh, waste at the end of the day. And we also produce and consume energy. So we have uh, a balance between input energy and output energy at the end of the process. Now, here we can see an article from 1977. Now, this was a turning point in incineration processes. Now, after this article, 
we started to see incineration in smaller countries with not much land area. They had environmental approaches and they started to prioritize incineration as a process that was far better than landfill, despite the cost. Now, this researcher has found that some highly toxic compounds, persistent compounds, accumulate. And these compounds are found in incineration plant ash, in fly ash. So these are dangerous trace components. They're found in the fly ash and the flue gas of municipal incinerators. So this is something that we need to bear in mind in the incinerator process. This um, is uh, where we began to understand dioxins in fly gas. So what are the properties of these different dioxins? Well, they are crystalline, they're white and they're solid. They have a very high boiling point and melting point. They're very stable up to 750 degrees centigrade, so they do not melt easily. They are, um, it's not easy to biodegrade. Um, this means that they are not destroyed or they do not biodegrade readily in the environment. They are highly soluble in gas and in organic solvents and not very soluble in water, which means that they do not necessarily accumulate, uh, accumulate in the human, uh, they do accumulate in the human body. This means that they are harmful, first because they're very toxic. The PCDDs are uh, toxic substances. They are persistent as well, because once they have been released into the atmosphere, they remain there. They are found everywhere on this planet. They're liposoluble, they can be dissolved by fat, and they bioaccumulate. This means that they accumulate in the human body and they often form part of our diet. Therefore, we need to legislate against these dioxins. So what has been done since 1977? We've seen that it's an organic compound. So the first thing we need to do is dispose of it, burn it correctly. This is the Spanish royal decree. This is the very first royal decree that was created specifically to legislate against the production of pollutants caused by incinerations. So what goes on? First, we burn them at high temperatures, 850 degrees Celsius. For a chemical reaction to take place, we need long enough, two seconds. And we need oxygen in sufficient concentration, so we're going to have 6%. This is the basis of our legislation. In fact, this is based on European legislation. Then if we analyse the dioxins being released by the furnace, what's there? We still find dioxins. Why? So this was the first legislation, the first regulation that was introduced. But then we see legislation against maximum contents in the flues. We have legislation for particulates, acid gas elements, which we have also seen in high concentrations. We also legislate against production of heavy metals, metals, uh, carbon monoxide, organic compounds, and so on and so forth. So this is a set of compounds that, for which we have legislation. And this includes dioxins and furans. But this, the Royal Decree did not fix a specified amount. The regions were allowed to choose these quantities. And in fact, the regions had to come up with the maximum value that was allowed, much like any other country of Europe. And then we have the next stage in legislation, uh, 10 years later, this is in 2000. What important modifications did we see in this new law compared with the first law 10 years earlier? Well, there was a decrease in maximum 
um, uh, emissions allowed of, of polluting agents. But there are other various areas that I'd like to highlight. Mm, change in the type of measures. We weren't talking about daily averages, but average values over shorter time periods. We also see that the, the metals also have changed. There's a new group of metals. And they have also raised the number of different metal elements as well at the same time. Let's look at our ox uh, nitrogen oxide. Now, this wasn't, didn't feature earlier. Nitrogen oxide is produced in any kind of combustion uh, by cars, home chimneys, flues, and factories. We're always going to produce nitrogen oxide, but it wasn't legislated against until this particular moment. And now on the right-hand side, we can see the transposition of the European Directive. There were very few changes with regards to the previous legislation. However, we did change the way in which we have to implement measures regarding the metal groups. But in every other respect, it was virtually the same. The time in which it's measured, how it's measured, and so on and so forth. So that is the legislation that we had to comply with up to that date. Now. If we look at the legislation, if you want to control our emissions in our incineration plants, what do we have to do? We have to look at particulates, acid compounds, substances that can be converted into nitrogen, water, and CO2, and then other um, compounds which cannot be processed and transformed. Particulates. How do we differentiate one from another in two different ways? Size, because some are bigger, some are smaller, and the chemical composition. So how do we avoid particulates being released into the atmosphere? We have to stop them, contain them. Acid compounds, where we have certain regulated acid compounds. These are the acids. So what are we going to do with the acids, where we have to neutralize through reaction? And then the transformable compounds, the hydrocarbon compounds, what are we going to do with them, where we can convert them into water and CO2 or nitrogen compounds? And mm, we have certain compounds that we can transform into, transform into nitrogen. We have specific reactions that we can apply here to this specific set of compounds so we can convert them into water and CO2. And then we have, finally, other types of pollutants that cannot be transformed. Metals, for example, if I have a metal in its gas phase, a part of mercury, for example, these techniques are not going to be applicable, therefore I have to use other techniques, for example, absorption, which is an entirely different process. And here we have a few technologies for particle retention. Mm, how effective are the, is the different machinery in particle retention? Let's take a look. Which equipment is most efficient, which is less? We have to look at the equipment. Some are less efficient, uh, particularly for small particulates, but um, we also have to look at various different equipments and techniques which are more effective depending on the size of the particulate, because the smaller the, partic the particle, the more efficient we need the equipment to be. We have sleeve filters also in our incinerator plants, these are in virtually all the incinerator plants. On the left-hand side, to give an idea of the size, we have a, a, the largest of the circle is the diameter of a human hair. The other circles are the PM10 particles and PM2.5. To give you an idea of how complex it is to work with these particles, so we have sleeve filters which are used in many different incinerators. Why do we use these? Well, because they drive down particle emissions. So very few particles are released using these sleeve filters, but we also use other particle retention systems, but mainly we use these sleeve filters. And a key characteristic is that from 0.1 nanometers upwards, 1.1 micros upwards, these are less and less effective. But in the incineration process, this smaller 
fraction is virtually non-existent, so it's negligible. And then below that, we see one of these sleeves is quite simply a filter that can retain particles in these gases. And on, next to it, we can see the flying particles that are collected by these uh, filter sleeves. Next group of compounds are the acid compounds. Obviously, we need different neutralizing processes. In some countries that have water scarcity, we cannot c pollute water, so we have to apply different dry technologies. Then we have another group, which are the nitrogen oxides. We have two different procedures, non-selective catalytic reduction and selective catalytic reduction. We can see the different processes on the slide. Now, this is a process to reduce nitrogen oxides, quite similar to what we use in our cars in the catalyzer. We have a three-channel catalyzer in the car, which we use to eliminate nitrous oxides, uh, but when we don't have uh, oxygen in it. So the flow it means that we don't have oxygen present in this, so we therefore need the hydrocarbons in the process. But the problem is that we have oxygen present in the air, and obviously if we have oxygen, then this will not be viable. So we need a specific reducer. This is why it's called a selective catalytic reducer. We might use urea, for example. And this is how the system is installed. We have mm, little monoliths. These are the beginning of the process before the transformation. We have specific catalyzers that work at specific temperature conditions. Now we have the phenomenology in the combustion process. We need to regulate with, uh, according to the calorific content so that we can have good complete combustion processes and we're also going to produce volatile metal substances and we need to be able to avoid all this through proper control. Next we have dioxins and furans. Mm. Now basically this represents 210 compounds altogether. Of these 210 different compounds there is a high variety in different uh, in, in its toxicity. 2, 3, 7 and 8 TCDD are the most highly toxic dioxins. You can see this on the right hand side. And of these 210, only 17 isomers are toxic. So what do we do? We look at factors of toxic equivalence. Basically this means uh, how, what is the damage produced by these specific uh, dioxins? We need to look at them on a sliding scale. And then we get the TEQ, which is the total equivalent toxicity. And so how do we avoid uh, dioxin emissions? Well, you can see the process. We have on the left-hand side, we have a prevention system. First of all, we have to ask the question, why do we produce dioxins? What temperature? Why are they formed? So we need to therefore analyze where and why they're formed. What temperature? what conditions, but you can see that on the slide. And then we have to ask how we're going to stop this being released. Well, we use the absorption system or we use catalytic destruction methods using the same catalyzer that we used with uh, nitrous oxygen, uh, nitrous oxide. So we therefore, having applied these systems, have driven down the number of dioxins that we are releasing. You can see the systems have been applied and they're used to great effect. Mm, and what we want to do is, uh, finally, we, we have this model in Spain. You can see where we have the different uh, plants. We have 10 different incinerator plants in Spain, uh, currently in operation. One in Galicia, another in Cantabria, one in Basque Country, four in Catalonia, one in Balearic Islands, one in Madrid, and the other one in Melilla. Those are our incinerator plants. They all have differing capacities, and we incinerate approximately mm, between 2,100,000 and 2,300,000 tons every year, uh, according to data that you can look up on the internet if you wish. So in Spain, 
we don't have that many incinerator plants. It is 9% of all waste are treated in our incinerator plants. So that is the situation in Spain. Technically, it is possible for us to reduce emissions. We have figures that back this up from these incinerator plants that show that dioxin emissions is 10 times lower than the general figure. So if it was 0.01% before, it's 0.01. So we have driven it down tenfold thanks to these new technologies. Obviously, it costs more to introduce these new systems. But that's what we have. So thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you all. We have 10 minutes for questions. The first question that I can think of is, could we incorporate these systems into the plant once the plant is up and running? Because I get the feeling that all the research, the systems are getting better to reduce the emission particles. Can you add this to a plant, or does it take a lot of engineering, and it needs a certain kind of plant? As legislation has moved forward, some plants were closed down because it really wasn't worth making the investment to improve them. Other plants could be adapted by bringing in new equipment. In fact, bringing in this new equipment has been done depending on the cost and the potential. Because before you install a, catalytic, a selective catalytic reduction system, is to put the reducer not in that system, but use a non-catalytic one as far as it will hold out. So instead of using this system for destroying dioxins, is that you have powdered carbon, do you use that to absorb it? But the cost of this is quite high because I'm continually spending on my reagents and it also includes, increases the number of uh, the amount of fly ash. So it's not simple to moderate an insulator once they're installed. But these are very compact and don't take a lot of space. I'm also asked, what are the chances of finding dioxins from incineration? Because according to what you said, you have a, a safe system there. I would say the chances will be absolutely minimal. To give you an example, la probabilidad. Si bajamos a 0,1, pues vamos bajando y si encima es 0,01, pues es mínima. De hecho, hay estudios hechos en eh, la cantidad de dioxinas que entran en la incineradora con los residuos y las que salen. Y sa entran más dioxinas que las que salen. Pero eso no quiere decir que la legislación no haya que mantenerla tan dura como está. En mi opinión, este tipo de legislación habría que extenderla en otras instalaciones. Otra pregunta, ¿qué aplicaciones reales de aprovechamiento térmico, térmico del calor de la combustión serían viables o posibles en Canarias para cumplir con las exigencias de eficiencia energética establecidas por la normativa europea? Pues eh, las dos formas de aprovechar esta energía, una es como energía térmica que generalmente son los países fríos, es decir, para calefacción y también lo utilizan en invernaderos para calentarlos, aquí eso no tendría sentido, aquí habría que transformarla en energía eléctrica. Entonces sería un porcentaje de residuos que se destinan a la obtención, no de residuos, ¿eh? sino de esa fracción que no podemos hacer otra cosa, obtener energía eléctrica. ¿eh? O sea que sí poco en esta línea también de, de las particularidades del territorio, preguntan qué viabilidad en un territorio disgregado y ultraperiférico como el nuestro tendría la incineración. Hombre, técnicamente habría que estudiar frente a otras alternativas, esos son estudios técnicos, y ver incluso qué inversión es la que se necesitaría, qué poder calorífico tienen los residuos después de haber hecho todas las operaciones, es decir, los que vamos a quemar, lo que se llama el RDF, 
esa tiene un poder calorífico que yo creo que está ahora sobre los 2000 kilocalorías, 2200 cuanto más bajo es menos energía tiene, luego menos energía aprovecha y luego el rendimiento energético de estas plantas The energy return from these plants is approximately between 20 and 25% but this also depends on the technology that's used but it's around that number If we're talking about energy recover from thermal measures, the, the, the return's not going to be too great. It's the same thing with combustions in furnaces, etc. The question is probably, as this, we have limited land space like we do in the islands, whether it would be recommendable to use this method or should we look for something else here? I would consider this that I would compare with any other alternative before landfills.